And so now I get to do the, the brief introduction to Peter Carlin. He was born in Syracuse, New York, but raised in Seattle. And he attended first, uh, is it McAllister College in Minnesota, uh, but then he finished up his education at Lewis and Clark. And then over the course of a varied writing career, he has worked as a freelance journalist, uh, contributing cover stories to the New York Times Magazine and the LA Times. He worked for several years as a senior writer for People Magazine. And then in 2000, he moved back to Portland uh, to be the television columnist for The Oregonian. Uh, Peter has authored or co-authored five books, The Brave New Bride, Beyond Limits, A Woman's Triumph on Everest, and he wrote that with Stacey Allison, Catch a Wave, The Rise and Fall and Redemption of the Beach Boys' Brian Wilson, Paul McCartney, A Life, and his most recent book, Bruce, a biography on Bruce Springsteen. His works have been described as astute, engaging, and great prose. The New York Times wrote of his book, Bruce, that Carlin gets across why Mr. Springsteen has meant so much for so long for so many people. One reviewer has declared that if there is anyone who writes about modern musicians better than Carlin does, I don't know who it could possibly be. However, there is a dark side to Peter. <laughs> Bill O'Reilly has declared in various statements that Peter is a far left TV critic who is an idiot and mentally unbalanced. So with that, I would like to pre uh, introduce Peter Carlin. Thanks, thanks for, thanks for coming and uh, that was an introduction, man. I'll tell you, that's hard to live up to. Or maybe all too easy, I don't know. Um, yeah, you know, O'Reilly, that whole thing was really weird and it's been sort of strangely definitive in my career, despite everything else. It's like uh, when I quit my job at the Oregonian, uh, the guy, there's this, this national journalism site for journalists. Um, I think then it's Jim Romanesco does it. I think then he was still with the Pointer Institute. But the big headline in the story was, like, TV critic who feuded with O'Reilly leaves the Oregonian. <laughs> and that was like eight years earlier, so. But anyway, but I think, well, anyway, I won't get into that anymore unless somebody wants to know about it. But it was a long time ago and kind of, it's just sort of strange and strangely gratifying. But at any rate, um, <laughs> the only thing I'll tell you before we really get started is that I flew here from London yesterday and, uh, and so I'm several times, it's still several time zones away. And I don't, uh, so if I start meandering off course, just, just kind of give me the high sign and I'll try to get back. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit today about, um, um, I mean, um, obviously we'll, we'll talk a lot about Bruce, but I wanted to talk a bunch about just artists in general and uh, having written about them for years. Um, and written about a lot of people who are, you know, highly motivated or obsessed with doing something. Um, and one of the, my favorites is the first book I wrote, or the first biography I wrote, which I started about 10 years ago. It's about this guy, Brian Wilson. You guys know Brian, who Brian Wilson is in the Beach Boys? So you know his whole sort of wild legend and the, the craziness. So if I launch into this, does anybody need a little backstory before we go? But Brian, he came from this, 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 this blue collar family and his dad was a wannabe writer and was, or excuse me, songwriter and musician and, uh, and kind of a great guy in a lot of ways, but also mad as a hatter and grown up in a very sort of abusive family. So naturally he returned, you know, sort of, you pay that forward to your own kids apparently, unfortunately. And uh, so Brian had this very strange upbringing and his dad kind of left this sort of dark imprint on him. And as Brian turned out to be this preternaturally brilliant musician and composer, um, he had a lot of weird sort of goblins and strange things going on in, in his head and, and became very notorious for not only creating or famous for creating some of the most beautiful and sophisticated pop music ever, but then also uh, sort of notorious for hanging it all up in around 1967 and, and taking most of the next uh, 30 years off before, uh, you know, fitfully doing comes back, before coming back in the late 90s and eventually coming back to form. But it's that crazy thing that people sort of know him best for in a, weir in a weird way. It sort of defines his, 
his legend, and <clears throat> which is a real legend as opposed to mine, which is just fake. But um, I, I got to know him a little bit. I did a profile of him for People Magazine when I was, uh, when I was there in, in the late 90s when he really sort of came back for good um, and began his, his late life renaissance. And I had been a fan of Brian's for many years and sort of lived that, you know, was very aware of his whole mythology and, and sort of the strange terms of his life. Anyway, well, I'd spoken to him a bunch of times and then ended up writing this book and got to know him a, a little bit and spend a lot of time around him. And he is a very eccentric guy. My description of Brian is, is that um, he's, he's weirder than you can imagine, but not as crazy as you might think. A lot of the world just thinks he's stone cold crazy, but he's also maybe the most passive aggressive man on the face of the earth. And so he gets by a lot. He, 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 he gets rid of people and gets out of situations by basically amping up the crazy, which clears the room, which is exactly what he wants, wants to do. So, um, but if you can get him on a good day and he sort of knows you a little bit, he'll sort of relax a little bit and, and uh, you know, and you can have a decent or, or interesting conversation with him. So uh, a few years after the book came out, uh, he had a new record out that I thought was cool. So I was writing a story about it and I went down to see him in LA and I went up to his house and um, there was nobody around, like generally around big rock stars, they got handlers and people around to kind of make sure everything's cool and that nobody does the wrong thing, but, uh, but they sent me up to Brian's house and he was just there alone, you know, the family was away for the summer and he was just hanging out. And so I walked into him, he's, you know, we said hi and we walked into this living room and he had one of those big TVs, you know, and it was playing, um, it was playing um, uh, music off of one of those cable uh, music sort of channel things where you just get the sound and there's no, um, and, um, so we walk in and this song comes on and he goes, he's, he goes, wait a minute, and he's, he's listening to it and he goes, and he points at the TV and he goes, do you ever watch this show? And, um, and I'm looking at the screen and it's black, right? There's nothing happening on the screen. But he's like listening to the music and like staring intently at the screen. And so then I start staring intently at the screen because I figured there must be, like I, I wanted to fit in for, I mean, I didn't want to make him uncomfortable. And then also I thought, but, but then I began to think to myself um, that this is a guy who was capable of writing the song God Only Knows, which, do you guys know that tune? It's, and it really is one of the high points in, in, in popular music, like over the last 60, 60 years. And, and it's this, people have gone and, and, and uh, you know, not only pop critics, but classical music writers and others have, have sort of deconstructed the song and, and sort of marveled over the, the, lo the sort of beautiful, sort of unexpected logic of the melody and the way that it matches the words and that as the song sort of is reaching its, um, talking about, you know, it gets a sort of celestial thing going and as, 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 each, ver as, as each verse, I think, reaches towards the end, it sort of goes skyward, you know, as if toward heaven. Um, and he wrote that in 18 minutes in one sitting at the piano. And he said that, um, he was just sitting there fiddling around on his keyboard and suddenly this thing just sort of tumbled out of the air and, in, you know, into his hands. And he's not the only one. And the fellow that wrote the song, who wrote the lyrics for the song, who's a much more down-to-earth kind of guy, was with him at the time. And he said it was like Brian had left the room and that there was this kind of, like he was channeling something. He had become a kind of a, uh, an antenna for some other signal. And so I was thinking about that, and I'm sitting around looking at the blank screen the song is playing on. And I thought to myself, you know, to me the screen is blank, but who knows what Brian sees, what he's seeing in that. And it's, you know, obviously it's not right in front of him, but it's happening in his head somewhere. That there is something, someplace that he's gone, or something he's connecting with, that is, you know, in his eyes, as vivid as you know, anything that could be on the screen that we could actually watch together. And it occurred to me that that is really in some ways an object lesson in what the life of a creative artist like that is. What those particularly gifted, and you can call them geniuses or, or whatever. Um, and it's the sort of experience that, that I think kind of defines the distinction between, you know, ordinary people like, you know, ourselves who sort of walk around and chew gum and go to the store and 
you know, and trip on the sidewalk um, versus someone who has that same kind of experience and can describe it in a way that makes, you know, that, that, that can create a kind of transcendent connection to other people. Um, and he sort of, I've seen this thing sort of again and again in people. And I always marvel at um, the times when some, you know, some artist or other, will, you know, popular artist, will do something strange or be caught out not being as normal as everybody else. And it's so easy to come down on them, you know, for the media, you know, and, or anybody to say, well, you know, why can't they be more like everybody else? It's like, but you don't want them to be like everybody else because everybody else can't write God Only Knows in 18 minutes. You know, everybody else isn't going to be able to write Thunder Road, you know, despite the fact that you may have grown up in a situation where, you know, you live in that same little town and you have that same, um, that same sense of being cramped and being just sort of crammed into this little life that, that you desperately need to escape. And, you, you know, the escape is so important, you don't care where you're going. You know, as Springsteen says in Born to Run, you know, someday we'll get to that place that we really want to go and we'll walk in the sun. Um, and that's something that he can't, you know, and, and, and for somebody like Bruce who came from this crappy little blue collar, you know, armpit in, in, in central New Jersey, um, and then even Asbury Park, which is where he went to, to you know, to start his, his career, was a tumble down, faded, rusted out, sort of dying vacation paradise from the 20s and 30s. And yet, there's something about that that he connects to and something about the way that he writes about his life there that sort of transcends the, the day to day, the sort of prosaic existence of, of just being a, a, a skinny, poor kid wandering around these towns into the experience of lives that are taking place not only all around the country, but all over the world. Um, overseas, it's amazing that overseas, um, I mean, Bruce is obviously, obviously still very popular here, but overseas it's, uh, it's phenomenal. It's like the born in the USA era all the time, you know, and people are just crazy for it. It's like Beatlemania type crazy type. And, and uh, you know, and, and, and what they, and you, and you wonder, well, what is it about, you know, his songs about New Jersey or about America or, or about these kind of American mythologies that, um, or ideals, I should say, that connect with somebody who's living in Belgium? Because it really does. And they have extraordinarily different lives than we do. And um, I think it comes down to, particularly in his, in, 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 his, uh, in his situation, or in his case, and with a lot of other people, that it's not just the stories that he's telling as much as the emotional fire inside of them. And so, same goes for Brian Wilson. If you listen to those early Beach Boys songs, even the ones that people talk about being, well, you know, they're so happy and carefree. Um, but they're not. They're the farthest thing from that. They're about the pursuit of, of being happy and being carefree. But, um, but there's a lot of, like, really dark and angry things happening in the corner. There's always, like, a little uh, antagonist somewhere. The, the song I fixated on uh, at one point, and actually it ended up naming the book after, is called Catch a Wave. I remember listening to it when I was a little kid. Um, I picked up on the Beach Boys in the early 70s when uh, they kind of had their first resurgence. You know, they were all still in their late 20s and early 30s at the time, but they'd been old hat for a long time at that point, you know. And, uh, but the first line of the song, which is painting this kind of spectacular portrait of surfing and the sort of uh, physical and, and, and spiritual possibilities of surfing, the first line of the song is, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to try the greatest sport around. And so you're leading with three words, and of course my initial sense is, excuse me, afraid of what? Like, it's clearly there's something to be afraid of. And which, of course, they go on to sort of, in their cheerful, boyish way, to sort of describe as well, the, like, the, 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 the persistent possibility of, 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 of physical uh, injury, or perhaps death, in the course of riding these waves, which are dangerous. Um, and also there are these kind of mean-spirited dudes wandering around the beach telling you that what you're doing is, is, is stupid and that you shouldn't be doing it. And, and that goes from song to song in the Beach Boys. I mean, there's always some kind of authority figure sort of peering down and sort of, or some darkness on the edge of the frame that's compelling the narrator of the story or, or, or the song forward. Um, in, in Fun, 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 there's the, 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 the father figure who's going to take the girl's car away. 
even, you know, and obviously, you know, if you want to look at it in terms of, of an allegory, I mean, what's more free, and Springsteen knows this as well, what's more wide open and free than the highway and having a fast car? And yet there's somebody there who's, who's bound and determined to take that away from you. There's sort of, you know, and again, I mean, you talk about Brian Wilson's past and exactly how screwed up his family was and exactly how forbidding his father was and, and how much he tormented him, even in the course of Brian being like the most successful songwriter and producer in, you know, in the United States and one of them, you know, one of the two or three in the world. Um, and with Springsteen, again, I mean, the story comes back to his father, who he's written about time and time again. And I think that's one thing that, you know, um, that people have really connected with is that in his songs, there is always this kind of disconnect with his father. And there's this sense of, you know, what seems like anger, but is really, just, and it is a kind of anger, but it's not necessarily projected at his father. He talks about, um, there's a song called Adam Raised a Cain, and it's just this bitter kind of portrait of these father and son who are completely disconnected, but yet, you know, except by this kind of hot-blooded rage that, that, that sort of both holds them together and, and pries them apart. And you think that he's, you know, songs like that, you're supposed to dismiss your father, the elder generation, as being worthless and, and, and move out on his own. But Springsteen never does that. There's always, there's always a level of empathy and sorrow for his father. And he talks about in that song, I mean, the keen line is, uh, you know, daddy worked his whole life for nothing but the pain. And he walks these empty rooms looking for something to blame. And you inherit the sins and you inherit the flames. Um, and... It's, 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 it, it's that kind of feeling, it's that kind of, that sense of, of, of desperation, of the need for escape and the need for, um, you know, for, for that kind of independence, that kind of wide open horizon, where you're not even sure what you're going to find and what's going to happen. But the point is the journey. The point is the attempt to get out from underneath it. And uh, one of the things that, you know, one of the reasons why I think Bruce among almost virtually all of his peers is still writing such fiery music and so, um, you know, and still sort of on top of his muse in a way that, that many others aren't. You sort of lose the fire after a while. Is the fact that his, all that is still very unresolved within him. His father passed away about 10 or 15 years ago and they had developed a, you know, a pretty good bond in a sense, but it was always tormented and a lot of it had to do with the fact that his dad was manic depressive. And so as a teenager, Bruce always thought that his father's inability to connect with him was some sort of personal um, rejection. When in actual fact, his dad um, just was unable to connect with anybody because he was so busy fighting off you know, the, the, the evil spirits inside of him, which were due to an undiagnosed and obviously untreated serious mental illness. It's all he could do to just put on his clothes in the morning and go off and try to earn a living. Um, and the interesting thing is, is, though Bruce is very conscious of this intellectually, and we talked about this quite a bit during our, our, our times together, um, that when it really came down to it, his intellectual understanding did nothing to resolve or, or to remove the hurt of his emotional experience of it. And I remember, I think it was maybe even during our first serious interview, um, I was kind of pushing it on some stuff having to do with his dad. He's written about it. He kind of feels in some ways that, you know, he kept saying, well, you know, I've already kind of written about this. But I knew there was more going on. Um, and so I kept pushing on the idea of, well, what exactly was it that he did to you? Because the question was whether there had been some sort of physical abuse that took place, which people can only assume because of the depth of the hurt and the depth of the anger. And uh, we had a very, Bruce is really fun to hang around with, believe it or not, and we'd had a very cool conversation, and he's funny, and he's a great storyteller, and he's really smart and quick. And, uh, but I, I sort of got to the point with him in this case where he um, finally just sort of stopped, and he looked up at me, and um, I felt like there was static electricity in the air and that there was this intensity, and his voice got really low, and he said, look, it wasn't what was done, it was what wasn't done, which was any kind of acknowledgement of me at all. And this is Bruce at 61, 
um, with kids of his own, um, you know, and a very in a, in a very clear intellectual understanding of exactly what had made their relationship the way that it was, exactly what had what it was that was eating at his dad that made his father unable to have that emotional relationship. But still inside, Bruce feels that hurt every day. And, and it's that kind of, um, you know, which is a terrible thing. I mean, it's horrible. And, and, and it's, he spent years, I think decades, trying to kind of master those demons or master the darkness inside of him, which he also inherited to some degree through the DNA. But um, it's that ability as an artist to be able to take that dark energy and channel it into something, you know, through this gift or whatever it is, your talent, or channel it into a kind of, make it explode into light. Um, but that doesn't come at, you know, and, and some people are capable of that. Um, and some people can only go so far with it before they, they, they overdose and die at 27 which happens. I've got a friend in, in England who's right, just finished a whole book about people that died at 27. And it's a, uh, you know, I haven't had a chance to read it yet, but it's, uh, you know, but you can see people get involved in alcohol, people get involved in drugs. A lot of what they're doing, again, is medicating that part of them that, you know, because they didn't have uh, the good advice or the good sense to go see a therapist for 30 years and then start taking antidepressants, as, as Bruce did. Um, but it is, again, I mean, sort of for me as a writer and as somebody who observes popular culture and the people that make it, and particularly these people who I consider to be really sophisticated artists and, and, and you know, world-beating artists, it's getting to that core of the disturbance, that it is the darkness inside of them that sort of paradoxically helps them create or compels them to create the light that we all get to bask in to some degree. Um, I remember one of my other sort of strange experiences in New York, I was, you remember that movie Shine about the pianist David Helfgott, who was, I think, you know, not only a brilliant musician, but also somewhere on the spectrum, as we say, um, and had a very difficult relationship with his, I, with his dad. Everyone, it's, I don't think everyone has daddy issues, but a lot of these guys seem to. He, uh, and the whole thing in the movie was that he had this screwy dad, and not only that, you know, the kind of, sort of again lit the fire beneath him and uh, so I, I ended up being taken to this party where he was appearing like right on the eve or at the time when the movie was coming out so he was at this party like maybe it was a book party or something I can't remember but I was there and I think I was writing a story about him for people at the time and so we walked through the door of this townhouse and he's somehow standing right at the door and so this guy who I'm with sort of introduces us and he says this is the guy that's writing the story and he goes like I can barely remember how he talked in the movie, but it's just that sort of, oh, great, 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 great. So he takes me by my hand and he leads me to the piano and he sits down and he starts playing and he wants me to sit next to him. So I thought, okay, you know, so I'm sitting there and I'm like, I'm pretty much fresh off the turnip wagon in New York and so all this is very new to me at this time, it was a long time ago. And he's saying, well, you know, it's, it's all daddy, you know, it's daddy, 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 daddy. And I'm sitting there going like, could I get a drink maybe, could I? Is there a bar by here? So, uh, but you know, it's a very common story. I was just reading a biography of Ernest Hemingway, who people know, I think, uh, and have come to either, in, in some cases, have come to despise him for being such a paragon of manly values, or you know, or at least in his characters and the way that he kind of lived his life. But the fascinating thing is that really his main subject that kept bleeding through in the work that was published during the course of his life and is at the center of several important books he wrote that didn't get published until after he died was the fact that the, the, the deep gender confusion in his life and the fact that he really was torn over his male identity versus the female identity and his characters even, he sort of plays this out repeatedly in his in, in these stories where characters talk about basically, you know, lovers will talk about, you know, cutting their hair and dyeing it to look exactly the same and how they kind of leave one another's body and enter the other. And, uh, you know, and then the phenomenal thing was that his son, or I don't know if phenomenal, but fascinating and ultimately tragic thing was that his son 
Gregory, who is another big Hemingway-esque type guy, as they all are, because they're Hemingways, I guess if anyone's going to be Hemingway-esque, it's them. Um, but he was a uh, cross-dresser, I mean, and like seriously, and like this was something that really defined his life, and by the time he passed away, um, I think in his early 70s, he'd actually had a sex change operation. Um, and so then you go back and uh, you think about those, 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 those Hemingway characters like Jake Bond, or excuse me, Jake Barnes in uh, The Sun Also Rises, who's had this mysterious accident that nobody really knows what it is, and it's that you know, he had his, his, uh, his testicles blown off, but he still, no, it was the other way around, I'm sorry, his penis was blown off, but he still had his testicles, so he had all the sexual um, feeling of, 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 of a normal man, but he just didn't have any, any way to express it. I mean, and how, <laughs> I mean, that's a tough one to hoe. I was talking to, um, <laughs> talking to uh, Gregory, uh, 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 Hemingway's oldest son, Jack, um, about, uh, golly, in 1999, I was doing another People magazine story. This was a centenary for, for Hemingway. And uh, so I went to see Jack up in Ketchum, Idaho, and he was filling me in on this stuff with, with, with Gregory Hemingway. And what he told me, and I don't even know if this is true, but he sure told me it because I wouldn't have forgotten, I, I couldn't forget it. He said, well, you know, um, he goes, he goes Gregory, Greg was in the, in the middle of having a sex change operation. He was going through the steps, and, and he goes, and then he gets his, his I, I, we're on TV, right? So I can't say, I can't really give the exact quote, but he described that Gregory had gotten far enough into, through the process where he had ex, ex, lost his, his male sexual characteristic but then met some woman and fell in love with her. And I said, uh, I just said off the top of my head, I said, He's, he became Jake Barnes. And Jack Hemingway goes, Jesus Christ, you're right. And I thought, <laughs> so, <laughs> people are, but, but, but you know, all these guys, I mean, and, I, and I'm not trying to justify bad behavior, I'm not trying to say that like Hemingway's brutality toward people and his nastiness, um, or Bruce's self-involvement and occasional nastiness to people and uh, is like a okay just because they happen to be artists, um, you know, and, and really good artists at that. You know, their behavior stands on its own, and I think Bruce, at least, largely has been a pretty upstanding individual. And, and Hemingway was very good to a lot of people and left a great, uh, did great things for him. But um, but it, but but there is that kind of transcendence. The, their ability to create that kind of work, which I think is sort of the redemption in, in all their stories. Because at the end of their lives or at the end, you know, for, for the rest of the world who don't know them personally, you have this brilliant work that traces the heart of, of everyone's humanity to some degree, everyone's confusion. And that is really, I think, what, uh, you know, certainly for my mind, I mean, that's the kind of work that sticks with people. That's why you can live in uh, Cincinnati uh, you know, 60, 50 plus years after Brian Wilson wrote those surfing songs and, and feel the ocean in your veins or feel that challenge. Because it's not really about the ocean. It's not really about the cars. It's about the things that, that, that compel people to, to, you know, to try those things. You know, it, that's what compels people to, you know, um, figure out that they're from a town full of losers and they're pulling out of here to win. Or to go fishing in the Gulf, you know. <laughs> and take out these massive, beautiful creatures because um, it's a hell of a challenge. Um, and um, so um, that is leading to, um, I guess, what, I, what, 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 what in some ways is the end of my prepared remarks, which really weren't all that prepared. But, um, but if anyone has any questions, I think I'm pretty sure we can we can keep the ball rolling a little bit. If you all want to ask specific questions about uh, about specific things, and if uh, so, anybody anyone has a question? Come on, let's break the yes. Yes, sir. Yeah, you know. So the question is, did you guys hear that? Uh, he asked if if I was writing more books about. Uh, musicians and the answer is yes. I was. I'm working on a book now about Paul Simon, who's really cool and interesting and complicated person, all into his 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 little self. Um, and, uh, and in fact, that's why I was in, in England. 
but uh, yeah, no, I sort of, I, ha I have this feeling that I should uh, at some point break out of that, uh, you know, it's sort of becoming a shtick for me to write about music, I mean, which is in some ways fine with me because I, 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 I really, you know, I love music and I love, fascinated by musicians, but, um, but you know, I've done a lot of other stuff. It's, it's weird people, to the extent that anyone knows who I am now, it, it's, uh, a lot of that is shaped by the fact that I'm like a music writer, but I've really only been a music, it's like of all the stuff I've done since, you know, you know over 27 years, um, 28 years, 10% of it or less has been about music. It just happens to be the last 10%. So, yes, sir. Okay. Sure. Um, well, you know, like John Lennon, um, Abraham Lincoln, um, <laughs> you know, um, who else was the, you know, there's just fast, you know, I mean, anyone who's really on the edge of, of one of the things I realized about Springsteen, um, or that was interesting about being around him and about being with the people who had been around him and had worked with him, um, is that is that part of that is or a lot of them get sort of get swept up in this notion that, which I think is very real is that when you're working with him it's it's a thrill because he puts everything he has into it and so and the people who work with him particularly on his music and you know and creatively have this sense that like it's easy to, to get this feeling that like what could possibly be more important than this what's a better job than than working for Bruce Springsteen if you want to work yeah, you know, I mean, particularly if you're in music or entertainment or or in anything really, because the guy is in so many ways. I mean, not only a fantastic writer, but also uh, you know, and musician and performer and stuff. But he also kind of animates, I think, this this very fundamental kind of American, I you know, sort of progressive ideal of uh, you know. I always think of him. You know, those Norman Rockwell paintings of the. The, 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 the freedoms, the how many freedoms there are supposed to be, there's like four freedoms I guess, They're, they come and go you know depending on the NSA but um, <laughs> but that, there's a guy standing up in the public meeting and he's got his sort of gray cloth coat on and he's got like papers sticking out of his jacket and he's like saying his piece and standing up and everyone's just sort of looking up at him with this look of at least respect you know which doesn't look like anything on TV today <laughs> or in Washington D.C. from what I can see. But, um, but that's really sort of a, you know, to me that's kind of who he is to a great degree. It's that very, it's that sense of just like, you know, one man, one vote. It's a very populist sensibility, I think, of, of, you know, a democratic country where people are free to speak their mind and other people will respect them and, you know. He says in one song that I thought was a, a brilliant, he's a, he, brilliant description of the essence of, I think, the dream America we all want to live in, however we define it is, you know, it's a beautiful, you know, we're lucky to be, um, uh, we're lucky, to, oh, golly, now I'm going to forget the word, or the, 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 the sentence, or the, the, the phrase, but he says, uh, um, nobody, he says, this is a beautiful, we're lucky in this town, it's a beautiful place to be born, um, nobody crowds you, nobody goes it alone which to me is sort of like a very concise description of the kind of community everybody wants to live in. That's just how you define those things that, uh, you know, that ultimately make it a ball game. So I don't know, so you asked me who else I would want to, you know. <laughs> Ooh, um, people like that? <laughs> Any other questions I can try to feel? Yes, sir. Uh huh. McCartney, I never really met, but yeah, I think that he is. Um, he had somebody I'd like to meet. I already wrote a book about him and everything. <laughs> He's still alive, but um, yeah, you know, I mean, a lot of that. Uh, one of the interesting things about the Beatles story, and particularly John and Paul's, is that they were both the thing that sort of that brought them together was um, this, this sort of shared sense of loss, because Paul's. You know, John, of course, had that very traumatic thing, or, you know, in his life where his parents split up when he was a little kid, and they did him the great favor of uh, saying, well, now you can choose. Who do you want to live with? Yeah, which is, you know, to like a four-year-old or whatever, which is kind of like, all right, it's on you, 
little child figure it out. And uh, so then they screwed him as badly as they could because he went, first he was going with his dad and then he turned around and his mom's standing there on the beach. So he goes running back to her. So he's going to stay with her. But then she promptly turns him over to her sister and sort of took off and didn't really deal much with him for the next 10 years. And he was just, they had just reestablished a relationship and, um, and which she was v taking a lot of meaning from, and then she got run over by a car and killed. And Paul's mom had died when he was of cancer when he was 14. And, uh, you know, John had already started playing the guitar and getting into music before his mom actually died, but, uh, but he was still dealing with that, you know, that sort of primal trauma with his parents being rejected by both parents, thank you very much. Um, and Paul, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's almost like a because of this, therefore that type of thing, where when his mom died and he was traumatized by that, he picked up a guitar and all that energy, you know, all that grief and all that, uh, you know, he channeled into the, learning how to play the guitar and spent hours and hours and hours and hours working on that. And also he had, you know, there was already talent in his family, but it was a, uh, you know, it's a pretty simple calculus right there. Um, and you can hear, you know, the same kind of, uh, uh, you know, you can hear him working through that loss in a lot, you know, include, in a lot of his songs, including Yesterday and, you know, and others where, you know. Uh, but the other thing, if you go back and you look at those pictures of the Beatles coming out of Liverpool, when they were particularly young, when they were, like, still scruffy looking a little bit and uncomfortable in their suits, one of the very first promotional photo sessions they did um, um, was they were posed in bomb sites in Liverpool. So because they still hadn't quite recovered from World War II and the Germans had, you know, bombed uh, Liverpool richly because it was a port and it had a lot of, you know, obviously the shipping was running through there and there was a lot of stuff stockpiled there. And, um, and so here are these handsome young kids who are like, with their instruments and standing there together. And it's almost as if they're blossoming out of the ruins of the old Liverpool and sort of out of this destruction and out of this sort of fire and, and death is emerging this growth. And when you talk, when you start considering, or at least when I start considering the, um, you know, the fire, you know, the sort of crazed passion of, of uh, Beatlemania and for, you know, which in some, some respects continues into this day, um, I think again about those pictures and I think about the sort of implicit message beneath that, the idea that through art, you know, I mean, that these got, what these guys kind of symbolize is the rebirth of life and of energy and of hope coming out of like literally the ruins of, of this town. Um, and, and, and uh, you know, they'd posed for, I think in the first photos, that were, it was less of a formal photo session, but their friend Astrid, when they were playing in Hamburg, took them to sort of overgrown, kind of ruiny type buildings, and you know, with sort of busted trucks and cars in them, and took pictures of them there. So again, it's that same, I don't know why, but people kept, kept imagining them, or photographers kept visualizing them, sort of emerging from these, these sort of ruined sites. And again, you know, in America, people talk about their appearance here just in the dark weeks after JFK's assassination, and it's kind of the same, the same story. Um, so, but the terrible thing is that, I mean, when I when you think about this, I think it's kind of soul crushing. Is that after, you know, creating so much, you know, uh, love and 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 wild, um, you know beautiful music and, and this really powerful sense of rebirth, they got repaid by the crazy elements of society who decided that they needed to kill them. And I think in, obviously, John, it was, it was immediate, but uh, the guy that came to stab George Harrison, you know, George had been recovering from his cancer quite well and was cancer-free until that weirdo burst into his house and stabbed him, which was a much, you know, it's obviously it's, you know, he almost died from that and there was a terrible physical trauma that went along with that, and guess what? It wasn't a few months before the cancer came back, and, and this time it, it did him in. So, it's, it, it's, to me, it's interesting to kind of, to, to, to sort of trace the, you know, to, to sort of look at the music and look at this art in, in the context of these other kind of social and political and, and cultural uh, sort of uh, events. 
narratives. And uh, anyway, yes, sir. Oh, who? Yes, did you have a question? No, you go first. He deferred to you. I mean, I'm, I'm obviously an imbalanced and unfair writer, so I think that intimidated them into, no, um, you know, it's, it's interesting. I, um, the Springsteen thing was, was sort of surprising. I mean, I mean, I'm fighting that same battle now with Paul Simon to some degree, where he's fighting the battle of trying to make me not, to make me leave him alone or whatever, but, um, but I, you know, in the Springsteen case, I mean, I can tell you, they, they ignored me, you know, really, their stock answer was, no, you know, we're not interested. And that went on for a year and a half. But then suddenly, I think I had done enough work and um, they had, and began to become ubiquitous among people that they knew. And, you know, and I think what they heard back was that, you know, I, I wasn't that bad a guy after all. And it happened to, you know, coincide with uh, a point where I, you know, they began to think about, you know, the legacy and that having a book like that out there, an independent book that was going to be, you know, hopefully pretty well considered and serious, wouldn't be a bad thing for them, at which point they called me up and, and kind of got increasingly involved over the next year and a half. Um, so that's how it worked in that case. With Brian Wilson, I mean, I, I just kind of knew those guys. And so there was no doubt that I was going to get access to him. Um, and McCartney resisted my charms altogether. Um, and I'm still sort of unclear what's going to happen with Paul Simon. But, um, but the challenge is, I mean, I did a, um, uh, you know, I mean, that, that Hemingway book I, I was talking about, um, I mean, obviously the writer had no access to Hemingway, but he had done so much work and done, done so much research and talked to people and, and had really, um, and managed to create a narrative, I thought, that really didn't depend, and there was enough Hemingway on the record and enough letters and enough archives out there that you could learn a whole lot about Hemingway um, just from this guy's research and, and, and his ability to kind of create a narrative that told a story that wasn't, that went far beyond the, and on this day this happened, and on that day that happened type of thing, which was telling a much bigger story. And, and that's sort of, I think that's always my ambition getting into these things, is that you want to try to create a story that isn't just about like, and on this day he recorded this song or wrote this song, or, 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 or whatever. So, but in terms of, you know, I mean, I don't know, it's sort of up in the air. I wish I, wish I knew for sure, because then I would do that every time, and, and I wouldn't have problems, but, but it's just kind of, it's game of attrition to some degree, and uh, it's, you know, but I got another year and a half before the book is due, so I got time. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Well, you know, it was always three, like three years. I did two of those books when I was working full time at the Oregonian, and I would take like book leaves here and there when they were still doing that. And then, um, and then, um, and that was always kind of a three-year thing. But a lot of that three years was spent me actually with me not doing anything, you know, or or just squeezing time out on the side. Um, but uh, but I quit the paper a couple of years ago. Wait, what year is this now? No, three years ago, and. Um, once that became intolerable. And, um, and so now this is like the first whole book I'm going to do without another job. And um, so, but it still looks like it's going to be about three years. But the Simon thing is a very, very long and involved story and requires a lot of homework and, <laughs> and uh, reading and, uh, and that kind of thing. So it could be the same thing, but you know, that's fine with me in a sense. It's a good job. And then I don't know what I'm going to do next. So no reason to rush into the void. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, did you have one a few minutes ago? Oh, she asked it, okay, all right. Um, what else can I say? Um, Time-wise, we got another 10 minutes. Surely somebody has a question. 
Um, uh, yes, sir. With Bruce? Well, the thing that was kind of cool about that was that um, they didn't expect to have any control over it, over it whatsoever. And in fact, we're very um, clear on multiple occasions. I mean, Bruce and <coughs> both Bruce and his manager, John Landau, that, um, that they were just going to give me access and let me do what I wanted to do. And they had no expectation of control whatsoever. And um, I did ultimately let them look at the manuscript before it was done or before it was in final, absolute final version, but that was mostly for fact checking. And if they had any conceptual problems, the deal was bring them up and we'll talk about it. But they didn't expect to have any real authority over it. And um, I mean, Bruce in particular was at one point toward the end, we were having some editing conversation on the phone. And he said, look, I just want to reiterate this. Um, anything, he goes, if you found out anything about me that you didn't use because you thought it would make me feel uncomfortable, put it in. I was like, you know, and it, which I'd already pretty much done anyway because first of all, that was some of my best stuff. And, uh, you know, it wasn't my goal to set out to become like besties with Bruce. But um, in my sense was even if that were my goal, I wasn't going to get there by, um, by, 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 you know, making a whitewash because he, uh, you know, because that's not how he works. And so he wouldn't really have a whole lot of patience or respect for that. And I had no interest in doing that anyway. And so, um, you know, the goal is to try to be as honest and as forthright um, and hopefully as smart as he can about, you know, what's going on in this guy's rather complicated life. So, so that's, what I, that's what I tried to do. Bruce is a really, uh, I must tell this story. Um, I had grown up, you know, um, being such a, you know, I went to a sh you know, that story people talk about about this sort of transformative experience of seeing a Springsteen show, and I went when I was like 15, you know, and, and a sophomore in high school, and, and that's a very, if y'all remember, a very awkward and troubling time, <laughs> or it was for me. Um, and I remember I, would, you know, I went to a lot of concerts, and it was always like because uh, they were really cheap then. You could go to a show for like six bucks or something like that, you know. Um, and Springsteen came into town, and I bought a ticket like a week before the show or something, and it was like no big deal. And I went with a friend of mine, and I remember walking in there, and the first, as opposed to like Ted Nugent shows and all that kind of stuff that I used to go see, like the the, the people in the audience seemed like reasonable grown-ups, you know. <laughs> it's like I like they weren't like out of their minds, and they but they weren't like they didn't seem to be just sort of boring either. They seemed to have really interesting internal lives. I was just guessing this, but. Um, Bruce came out and uh, played this incredible show, and it was like, you know, sort of for me at any rate, it was like seeing like the world, not only music but also culture and 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 life in a in a completely different perspective, and uh, you know, and and it really did something for me. Um, and so the weird thing was, after all those years, having managed to somehow you know professionalize that um, and be, have this opportunity to write this book that I had this, suddenly had this opportunity to go meet him and, and hang out with him. And, um, and it was, and that's sort of a weird situation, like what exactly, you know, how do you, how do you have that professional relationship? Particularly if it's a, slightly, I don't want to say antagonistic, but we are coming at this relationship from two very different perspectives with two very different goals to some degree. And so sitting around and talking to him, it was like playing, and when we were really doing the interview, it was a little like, uh, three-dimensional chess, you know, because I would ask a question, and I and he's really smart, and I would sit there and, and watch him pr sort of process not only just the direct terms of the question, but also trying to think like three or four steps ahead as to where is this leading, what, what's what's he really get, getting at here, and um, you know how can I control this and how can I, you know, guide him back to where I, I I'd really rather this conversation we're going right now. So, but meanwhile, I'm pushing back in exactly the same way. It's exhausting because I'm trying to kind of pay attention to what he's saying and to frame my next question, but also pay attention to what he seems to be hearing and what he seems to be getting ready to do about it. And so there was a lot of kind of push me, pull you type of stuff happening, and which is difficult with 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 your with my kids, um, but even harder with this guy who's extraordinarily smart and willful to beat the band. 
And so sometimes there were times when I really had to back up <laughs> because, you know, I was trying to also be politic about it and not screw up this, you know, you didn't want to make him too angry. But on the other hand, I didn't want to just let him shove me around. And so it was a very complicated and exhausting and fun period of time. But, um, but we got to do a lot of fun stuff and, uh, you know, uh, and, and see a lot of, and I got the chance to see, you know, be in a lot of very sort of dreamy fan type situations. Um, and then, you know, and, and often it was great and, and sometimes, you know, I'd see some things that were less appealing than I'd wished. But so it goes with everybody, I think. Um, but, uh, but yeah, no, so it's, it's always a really fascinating experience. And, um, and uh, takes a lot out of you. Yes, ma'am? With, 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 with my, um, a little bit. I mean, I have done mostly, I mean, I think I probably had more of a post-book relationship with Bruce than I had with, I mean, Brian Wilson's hard to have a relationship with under any circumstances. I mean, he's a great guy, and, and when I see him, it seems like he remembers who I am, which is sort of, there's a million people out there, but, you know, who he's interviewed and stuff, so that's always kind of cool. I mean, he's sort of a nice guy. I mean, he's a very nice guy. He's a very sweet guy. And Bruce and I, I you know, I, I sort of see him. I'll go to shows when I'm anywhere nearby. Um, <laughs> and generally, I, I say hi to him there, or I'll, we, when, I, when I was out in New York last December, I think we went out and got a drink or something. But it was, so it's sort of, you know, yeah. But mostly, you kind of do your job and away you go. But it's nice. It's, it still feels kind of friendly. Any last questions before we? Yes, sir. Did uh, going to England to see Paul Simon did that have anything to do with Sting? He wasn't there. He wasn't in England. His his past was. I saw Sting and, and Paul Simon up in Seattle like the week before I went. Did uh, Did you see that show or did you? No, I just went there to see stuff like that. Yeah, no, it's actually really cool because it's one of those tours you see these all the time where it's two big stars touring together to kind of magnify like their whole. They kind of work off each other. You, Yes, yeah, see, exactly right. That's the difference about this is that generally, you know, like those, like in the late 90s and early 2000s, there were a bunch of those tours. It'd be like Dylan and Joni Mitchell or Dylan and, and Van Morrison or whatever. And, and maybe they would do their separate sets and maybe at the end they would do one or two songs together. But this, on the other hand, um, they, like about a good 30, 40% of the show is them playing together. And they sing each other's songs and their bands kind of meld together and they, they harmonize on tunes and trade verses and stuff and it's it's really interesting it's actually quite I was impressed because these are guys are between the two of them I think they're 130 years old and, um, and they were actually covering each other's songs. Yeah, exactly 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 and it was really sort of I was really uh, you know I, I, uh, it, I think it's, in many ways it's a lot more interesting to see an artist with something to prove, you know, or, or who's working a new vein as opposed to playing all the greatest hits. And even though these guys mostly kind of did play their older stuff, they were doing it in a completely new and different way that I found to be just striking and often very, very cool. Though I sort of, at times I found myself sort of just sort of remembering how, what, what it is I don't like about Sting in the course of his solo thing. But on the other hand, he's, he's written some good songs and, and he's a pretty good musician and he's got a great band, so it's hard to complain too much. I was at a thing when I was a TV critic. Um, <laughs> there was, Sting for some reason felt compelled to make an album of lute songs. And he was talking about, so he had this like all lute band or something. They all came out playing Renaissance instruments. And uh, but he'd made this record, and he was based it on the work of some Renaissance composer who was very melancholy. So Sting was kept reveling in this idea of melancholy and kept wanting to talk about it. And um, when I when I decided to go to this this show that we have at this TV critics conference, they, they, PBS would always bring in a fast. You know, they would have these parties at the end of their presentations, and they would would have a big party or an event or something. And PBS's thing for a while was that they always brought in cool musicians. And so Sting was going to do the show. 
So I figured, you know, my buddies and I decided, well, we'll just go, and if we need to leave, we'll leave. But what they didn't tell us was that it was going to be in this really intimate room. So we're all kind of like crammed in there. And there was no leaving because if you left, it was like, you know, because the room wasn't any bigger than this. I think it was smaller than this. And it's like they barely mic'd because it's just them and a bunch of loots. And it was like you couldn't leave. You had to sit there for like an hour and a half. And it was a long hour and a half, you know. And I was just there and I'm like, God, man, it's like I don't. So I just figured, I, 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 at this show the other night, I figured if that loot comes out, I'm gone. I'm going to go get a beer. But there were no loot, so, so that worked out okay for all of us. But I just really, there's a lot that's cool about Sting, and in theory there's a lot that's cool about like a big pop star who makes an album of loot music. Or you would think, but not so much, as it turns out. Anything else? Yes. Yeah, sure. Uh, Darkness on the Edge of Town. That was the album that they were uh, putting together. That they were touring on that year. It was like kind of a real. It's you guys. I don't know. You know that. You probably know that record. It's a, it's a great record. It's got all you know. Badlands and the Promised Land and and like my all time favorite Bruce song, which is Racing in the Street. But I actually, um, my little high school buddy and I, we, uh, they were playing in this old hockey arena in Seattle, the, which is called the Arena, but it was a grungy old sweat sock smelling 3,000 seat place or 2,000 seat place. And, um, and uh, they curtained off part of the back for the acoustics because Bruce was uncomfortable playing in arenas like that at the time. And... Um, so, we, but we were up kind of on the higher level, which wasn't that high because it's this tiny place. And um, when they were leaving the stage at the end, we went scampering, sort of. And it turned out you could get behind the curtain and just sort of look down and see the, the guys walking off the stage. And when we got there, Bruce and Clarence Clemens, the sax player, were walking out like arm in arm. And uh, we were going like you do, Bruce, you know, which then seemed like a new thing to do. And they looked up and... <laughs> And they and Bruce's face lit up, which was one of the things that I thought was cool. Is that he wasn't like to him that was actually seemed like he was into that. Like he didn't want, you know, wasn't like, which some guys would do. He was all like, "Wow, I can't believe you guys took all that energy to run through security and and look down and and chant my name." Um, so that happened, and then many years later, I actually got the chance to interview Clarence Clemens, like just a couple of months before he died. So I described that whole thing to you, to him that I just told you, and he caught this look on his face and he goes, oh, that was you guys, <laughs> which I thought <laughs> was a great answer. I think he was kidding. <laughs> anyway. So I think that's it, guys. Thanks so much for coming. It's been great. Okay, um, oh, wait. I think some people have brought their books. Oh. Them, um, Absolutely not. No, wait, that was supposed to be a joke, uh, but it was backwards. Yes, I would love to sign the books, love to sign the books. Thank you, and I'm sorry there weren't any here to be sold, but, um, but I don't really do retail, and then I didn't get it, and, um, and so it was my fault. <laughs> but they're, yeah, it's because I'm a left-wing. Thank you, guys. Thanks for coming. <laughs>